Welcome to my Deutsch Digest 2, my introduction to the philosophy of David Deutsch. I guess I'm subtitling this one Deutsch Discoveries. David Deutsch is, among many things, physicist philosopher. First and foremost, I guess, an unusually prolific creative mind. As Popper admonished us to do, we should find a problem and fall in love with it until we solve it and then find to our delight a whole family of daughter problems for us to love. Now, it seems to me David Deutsch has been an exemplar of this way of meeting life and finding the joy in it and moving from problem to problem and finding ways of integrating them together into a larger whole. David Deutsch invented the theory of quantum computation. He created the first quantum algorithm, Deutsch's algorithm, which could be run on a quantum computer and demonstrate how much more powerful quantum computers are for certain tasks. He discovered key insights into the structure of the multiverse and how to explain concepts like fungibility and entanglement in the context of realistic quantum theory. We could list many scientific contributions that David Deutsch has made to physics and elsewhere. But as before, I'm going to put aside all the physics because, as I've already said, that's a separate project all in itself. Here, I'm going to mention more of David Deutsch's philosophical discoveries. 1. The function of evidence. The function of evidence is to decide between theories already guessed. Or we might also say, evidence is there to be explained. It's the explicandum, that which is to be explained. My trope example here is Eddington's 1919 experiment. In 1919, there was still a question about which theory of gravity was superior. Newton's universal law of gravity, couched in terms of an inverse square gravitational force? Or Einstein's general theory of relativity, couched in terms of space-time? In 1919, during a total solar eclipse, which is when the sun is obscured by the moon, turning the sky almost completely dark, the stars come out. The stars can be seen. Now, starlight passing close to the sun will be bent by the gravity of the sun. Eddington's experiment set Newton's theory, which said the starlight would be bent by X amount, against Einstein's, which said Y amount. The experiment ruled in favour of Einstein's. That is the function of evidence. That is always the function of evidence. Evidence does not support theories. It does not support Einstein now as being correct any more than the evidence prior to 1919 supported Newton's theory as being correct. David Deutsch has really tried to emphasize this in his philosophy, which brings me to two. The quantum multiverse is testable. It's a testable theory. It is absolutely astonishing to me that in physics, and that's quite a claim because there are many astonishing things in physics, that physicists themselves, including quantum physicists, seem not to understand how it is that the Everettian view of quantum theory, that's the multiverse to you and me, is testable, and indeed has been tested. Now the equations of quantum theory predict what happens during a double slit experiment. Photons are expected to strike everywhere possible, which makes a pattern like this, when a single one is fired at the screen. But we only ever observe a single dot. We don't observe the pattern after firing one photon. But that's fine because copies of us see it land elsewhere. If we were in a single universe and there were no other copies and no photons in other universes, we should expect the same point to be hit over and over again on the screen. That's what science tells us. That's what repeatability of an experiment is all about, getting the same result over and over again. But we don't get the same result, do we? Over time, we see a pattern build up. Which pattern? The very pattern that we would expect if we lived in a multiverse, because we don't live in a single universe. This is the only known explanation of these observations. We've ruled out, refuted, any single universe theory. Now, if you are not convinced and you think there is still some other interpretation of quantum theory, then we need to await the possibility of conducting Deutsch's other multiverse test to rule out those other interpretations. Almost all those other interpretations that differ from this multiverse explanation are termed collapse theories. These are theories that say all the other possibilities vanish upon the act of observation. It is called collapse because in technical language, the mathematical formulae governing this situation, called the wave function, is said to collapse onto one value. What causes that collapse according to those people? Observation. So what we need is an observer that can conduct an interference experiment in their own mind such that they can observe multiple states that interfere simultaneously. 
Now the long and short of this is that if the observation destroys the interference effect, the multiverse is ruled out. But if the conscious observer is able to report that they made only one observation, when the laws say many possibilities actually existed in parallel, and then subsequently interference occurs, we know that the claim about one observation was being made by multiple observers in multiple universes before they interfered and became fungible again. Wow, well that's all very dense. And for more, you should watch my final episode on the multiverse all about that because it does take some explaining. But for now, for my Deutsch discoveries here and now, understand that David Deutsch is the first to have come up with an experimental test of Everettian quantum theory and a philosophical defense of the ways in which the existing experiments are indeed only explicable in terms of the multiverse. All of this should be more widely known. 3. All evils are caused by insufficient knowledge. This really is a special case of problems are soluble. Not all problems are an evil. Many can be fun. Physicists find physics problems fun. Gymnasts find the problem of improving their routines fun. But no one would find anything fun, nor life worth living if there was nothing to do. As David has said, an unproblematic state is one without creative thought. Its other name is death. Death too is an evil which makes it a problem, and a soluble one. The death of humans, or indeed any life form, does not appear in the laws of physics. There is no physical law preventing immortality. We simply need to repair the damage done at a rate faster than entropy erodes us. Now this claim about evil clearly links morality to epistemology. Evils include disease. If we knew of a cure for cancer, we'd be rid of that evil. So too for viruses, bacterial infections, the slow degradation of our organs, especially our brains. All of that is an evil to be solved. Starvation, an evil. Crop failure, an evil. Hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, all evils, which, if we knew more, we could prevent either their occurrence or the damage that they do. We want to know what knowledge to pursue to solve our problem. What should we do next? That actually brings me to... What should we do next? This is a way of couching the central question of morality. Morality as what to do next is a way Deutsch conceives of morality different to almost all other moral philosophers. Those other moral philosophies, deontology, virtue ethics, utilitarianism, natural law, all of which can be put aside into the same category as being more or less useful ways and means of criticizing any moral claim of what to do next. If your theory of what to do next causes great suffering and no joy anywhere, well, a utilitarian or teleologist is right to complain. If your theory of what to do next requires you to act in an unjust or dishonest way, the religious and the philosophical are right to object. What Deutsch adds to this conception is that none of those systems of morality, grand as they may be, need be a foundation, the be-all and end-all, the final no-matter-what word, for that error is the error of foundationalism, and it is as wrong in morality as it is in physics or biology. There is no final word. There's no need to go searching for a foundation. There's no need to look for the foundation underpinning all of our moral choices, any more than there is to find a foundation beneath all of our physics. What we're looking for is merely incremental improvements to what we already know. And what we already know serves as an important bulwark against claims both spurious and possibly useful and as a way of distinguishing between virtue and evil. Just as an aside here, I should address the fact that David Deutsch actually is someone who works at the foundations of physics. But this does not make him a foundationalist. There is no contradiction here. He's looking for the deepest theories, not the final answer. So he's incrementally improving our understanding of the deepest levels of physics, now constructor theory, incrementally by improving on what's gone before, let's say quantum computation. But this does not mean that he thinks, for example, constructor theory will be the final word. It'll just be better than the other words that have gone before. 4. The mathematician's misconception. A profound and subtle idea about the relationship between mathematics, physics, and epistemology is the mathematician's misconception. Mathematics is about necessary truth. As David writes in The Fabric of Reality, necessary truth is the subject matter of mathematics not the reward we get for doing mathematics. What we know is always prone to error. We are prone to making mistakes. What we know about the laws of physics is this. Quantum theory puts a strict barrier before us on perfection. Even if one did not endorse literal quantum theory, people know that matter is subject to change in random ways. 
Even the second law of thermodynamics can give you that. Systems decay, they change over time. Computers can make errors. When a mathematician completes a proof, many think that this means the conclusion is certain, without error. After all, it's been proved. Many take this synonymous with, therefore, it's absolutely true. It's incontrovertible. But this is not the case. Any proof a mathematician does is a kind of computation. Not just kind of computation, kind of a computation. It's a computation. It's something a brain does. Or in some cases, a calculator, a computer. And brains, calculators, computers are made of matter, obeying physical laws. And those physical laws mandate imperfection, not perfection. Errors can be corrected, sure, but no process can be guaranteed to be error-free. Therefore, any proof, being a computation, is only as reliable as the laws of physics permit the computer, be it a human brain or a calculator, to be. Error is always part of the picture. The mathematician's misconception is that the process in mathematics can somehow stand apart from the physics, that they can tap into some kind of divine source of truth. But even if there were a divine source of truth, even if we granted that, the tapping in process is itself a physical one, and therefore subject to all the same kinds of errors any abacus, eroding stone or jet engine is. The laws of physics, thermal fluctuations, subjective quantum randomness, the imperfections of the real world. In short, the mathematician's misconception is this. Mathematical proof is independent of the laws of physics. Deutsch has explained that it is not. That is a real contribution to the foundations of the philosophy of mathematics and epistemology. So our knowledge of mathematics is not mathematics itself. In the same way, our knowledge of the laws of physics are not the final ultimate laws of physics themselves. We expect to find errors, eventually, everywhere. And that is actually a good thing. It means progress continues indefinitely.